so-called benign hypermobility syndrome. About 4 to 13 percent of the general population. Male to female rate about 1 to 9. Actually, the literature ranges from 1 to 9 to 1 to 13. So much more common in women than it is in men. In one study, 66% of children that had arthralgia or joint pain of, a, of an unknown etiology had hypermobility. All right? That is definitely hypermobility. And I still don't like to look at that picture. I've given this presentation many times. I don't like looking at that because it still hurts, man, when I look at that. So anyhow, I just try to ignore that, just focus on the text here. You know? um, anyway, it is diagnosed by primary care physicians in less than 10% of cases. So this is a highly mm, overlooked area. Right? There are other medical conditions that can cause hypermobility that you, you're, that you don't want your doctor to miss because it can lead to, uh, for example, like Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos. There can be some cardiac conduction defects that are uh, related to the uh, collagen problems that cause hypermobility. Anyway, point being that there are certain medical conditions that you want to make sure you don't miss if you find someone who has this problem with hypermobility. So how do you diagnose hypermobility? This is one of the fun things that we can do. So there's this whole thing known as the Brighton criteria. And in, among the Brighton criteria, you have the Baton score. So it's like Brighton and Baton. You got to make sure you don't get those things confused. So the Baton score, or Brighton score, different ways of pronouncing it, is a, a nine point scale. And this is a kind of a quick and dirty way of trying to figure out, OK, is there a possibility that you have hypermobility? So I want everybody to stand up, all right? All right, so I'm going to run through this with you here. So everybody take your hand here and see if you can take your pinky finger and bend it backwards so that it's like, I can't even do it, but to 90 degrees. All right, you can say I'm about 45 degrees, OK? If you can bend it back 90 degrees or more, that's positive one point, all right? Then you check the other side, all right? If you can do it on the other side, that's also a point, all right? OK, so kind of keep track in your mind how many points you're totaling. All right, second one. I can't even get close to this. I've had some injuries in my wrist from gymnastics, so my wrists are a little bit messed up. But if you can take your wrist and bend it downward and take your other hand and push on your thumb and try to touch your forearm with your thumb, all right? Uh, as you can see, <laughs> I can't even get close. I'm definitely failing on this test here. But if your thumb can touch your forearm, that's plus one point, all right? And then if you can do it on the other side, that's plus another point, all right? Uh, this next one, actually, you might not be able to see on yourself. You can kind of see it on the person standing next to you. But what it is, it's it, the elbow, this one here, all right? So what you do is you lock your elbow out. And I actually do have this one, and hopefully you can see it. But if your elbow, like, hyperextends, kind of like a so-called double-jointed elbow, more than 10 degrees, that's positive one point. So hopefully you can appreciate in me that my elbow definitely hyperextend. So for me, I get plus two points for that. All right? And this is a little hard to see on yourself. But basically, when you're standing, you, know, you kind of lock your knees back. And you see if your knees kind of do this like reverse curve all right? more than 10 degrees. That's also one point on each side. All right? So you've got these four tests, two sides. That's eight points total so far. The ninth point is this one here. It's if you can, keeping your knees straight, and I used to be able to do this when I was a gymnast, but if you can bend forward and plant your hands flat on the ground, that's plus one point. Now, what's interesting is you don't necessarily have to do that now. If you could do this at any point in your life, any point in your life, that counts. Okay. So now, the reason why that's important in terms of at any point in your life, let's say you have somebody who's hypermobile, but they have a back injury. Right? Well, if they have a back injury, what happens is their hamstring muscles will go into spasm. If their hamstring muscles go into spasm, they can't really do this anymore because the hamstrings are tight. Right? So they might have been able to do, you know, put their hands on the floor no problem before the injury, but once they have the injury, they can't do it anymore. Well, that doesn't mean they're not hypermobile. They're still hypermobile. It's just that the hamstrings are getting in the way. So when, when I ask that question, I ask, at any point in your adult life, have you been able to do that? All right, so in terms of scoring, if you have a Four or greater, that is considered a major criterion towards the Brighton criteria in terms of diagnosing hypermobility. So how many people had a four or greater that you could tell? All right, so we got a few people in here. All right. So that's something that I, I keep in mind in terms of when I'm evaluating someone. Reason that's important is that if you have a history of hypermobility, you can develop ligament, tendon, and joint pain with minimal trauma. So a lot of times I have people come in and they say, yeah, you know, I've got this shoulder pain and it just, it kind of came out of nowhere. Like I didn't, I never fell on it and I didn't have any sports injuries, um, but I played a lot of tennis. And so, you know, they had sort of this chronic little, a small amount of stress. But then if you find out that if you figure out that they're hypermobile, 
Well, then you can certainly have a tendon or ligament injury without actually having like trauma you know, to the joint. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the pseudo-radicular pain that I was referring to, that referred pain coming from non-nerve sources. So this diagram looks a little funky, but I'll walk you through it. On this side, we have the classic diagram of nerve-related pain referral in the leg. All right. So this is the front of the leg, this is the back of the leg. So a lot of people, when they have a pinched nerve, the most commonly pinched nerves are the L5 nerve and the S1 nerve. The S1 nerve, I know it's a little hard to read that S1 right there, but it goes straight down the back of the leg. So back of the thigh, back of the calf, and into the outer part of the foot into the toe. The L5 kind of comes across the front lower part of the leg here and over the top of the foot. So these are sort of two of the most common uh, pinched nerve areas at where people will have symptoms. You know, if you have a pinched S1 nerve, well, you know, I feel that electrical, you know, kind of burning pain going down the back of the leg into the foot. Is that the same as sciatica? Kind of. The uh, question was, is that the same as sciatica? If I could go back in time and eliminate a word from the medical dictionary, I would eliminate sciatica. I do not like that word, and here's why. Sciatica, by definition, means a pinching of the sciatic nerve. And the sciatic nerve lives kind of in your buttock area, and it's, it's basically a bunch of nerves coming out of the spine that form the sciatic nerve. The rate of true pinched sciatic nerve in people that have referred pain going down the leg is one in a quarter million. So it's very, very rare. What's much more common is if you have a pinched nerve up in your spine. And it causes this, leg, this pain going down the leg, which we call sciatica, right? But it has nothing to do with the sciatic nerve. It has everything to do with pinched nerve way high up in your back up here, right? Um, so it is sciatica in terms of what people define sciatica as being. But in terms of really being a pinched sciatic nerve, almost never happens. I think I've seen one in my career. Uh, OK, so S1 radiculopathy going down the back of the leg. Now let's look at this side. This shows the front of the leg, back of the leg. Referral patterns coming from ligamentous dysfunction. Okay, so all those crazy ligaments that, let me see if I can go back to the diagram, ah, right here, all this stuff, ligamentous stuff in the sacroiliac region. So you've got this sort of L shaped, you know, A, B, C, D sites that are defined in this particular textbook, A, B, C, D. You can see this D ligament uh, site right there, back of the thigh, back of the calf, lateral part of the foot, almost exactly the same as an S1 radiculopathy. And I see this, I would say almost every day I see this, where someone comes in and that pain going down either the back of the leg or the front of the thigh or something like that, and they, everybody tells them it's a pinched nerve, it's a pinched nerve. Well, MRI doesn't really show anything significant. They can have nerve conduction studies and EMGs and that doesn't show anything significant. So if the most sensitive tests available in medical technology are telling you that it is not a pinched nerve, and you examine them, and you do a physical exam, and their strength, their reflexes, their sensation, everything related to their nerve function is completely unremarkable and normal, well, is it really a pinched nerve? Or is it something like this, uh, a, a ligamentous problem, that's causing this referred pain going down the leg? And I see this all the time. And it's actually pretty simple to diagnose. Now, unfortunately, it does usually require an injection of numbing medicine into the ligament to prove that the pain is coming from the, you know, the, the referred pain is coming from uh, the back. But so many times what happens is patient comes in, I do a good examination, I check their nerves, make sure the nerve function is fine, I check their back, and oh, you know what, hey, you've got this significant tenderness right on that posterior sacroiliac ligament. And in some cases, it's so classic that when you push on that ligament, it actually reproduces their symptomatic leg pain. Well, right there, I'm pretty sure, you know, probably 95% sure that their leg pain is actually coming from this ligament. But to be 100% sure, what we can do is we do a little injection in there where I put some numbing medicine in there. We numb up that ligament, and if their leg pain goes away, Guess what, folks? It's not a pinched nerve. It's coming from that ligament. Because if the pain, the pain will only improve if the numbing medicine is in exactly the right spot. So if they actually have a pinched nerve and I'm putting numbing medicine into a ligament, their leg pain is not going to change. All right? And unfortunately, what happens is you see the reverse of that all the time. These folks have this leg pain. They go see the doctor. They think it's a pinched nerve. They, they go get the nerve block. And guess what? Their pain doesn't get any better. Why? because the pain's not coming from the nerve. If the pain was coming from the nerve and the doctor does a technically competent job at blocking that nerve, your pain should be pretty much gone, right? If the pain has not changed, it's not coming from the nerve, it's coming from something else. And that something else very well be not, have nothing related to the nerve and everything to do with a ligament or a tendon. And the good news is, it's easy to treat. I mean, you know, as long as you know where the anatomy is, it's easy to treat.